Hey guys, it's Key here from Keyland, and today we've actually got uh, Richard from Lullaman in here. He's the uh, technical manager for Oceania and looking after a lot of the advice on how to get the most out of the yeast and stuff like that. And today's really exciting because we've got a really new yeast, uh, which is Nova Lager. We were actually lucky enough to get a brick, and I'm going to show you some of that fermenting in a moment. And at the end of the video, we'll probably shoot the rest of this video maybe in about another four or five days. And hopefully those beers will be finished and we can taste them on the video and see what they're like. But, uh, you know, it's something that's very exciting. I love working with Lullaman. Obviously, being a distributor of Lullaman is very exciting for us because they come up with so much cool new stuff, which, uh, you know, is right down our alley. And the other thing is, you know, they've done a great job at previous releases as well. So they had a farmhouse that came out recently, and the one before that was the Verdant. And Verdant is now one of the top yeasts that I use on, like, literally every second brew. So when I hear another new yeast is coming out, I'm like, wow, this is awesome. Um, now, this is sort of a large yeast, is that right, Richard? But That's correct. It sort of can be used sort of for other beers too, is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a new hybrid large yeast which uses um, modern, uh, modern but classical breeding techniques. Uh, and it actually introduces more of the Saccharomyces cerevisiae genome into the, uh, into the strain. Uh, classically, we have uh, two groups of uh, lager yeast, which is the SARS and the Froberg yep. uh, groups. This one is a new group, it's group three, Renaissance, and it, like I say, it has more of that uh, Saccharomyces genome in it. Yep. And how would a yeast like this differ from your other like yeast? Like Diamond is an absolute cracker. I think for lagers, we recommend and have been recommending Diamond for a lot of the Australian lagers or European lagers for a long time now. It, you know, it's got great attenuation, flocculation, flocculation's really good, and just gives really clean results. But, you know, after using, you know, Diamond quite a bit, I almost feel like, what's the need for this other, <laughs> you know, new lager yeast, I guess? Absolutely. I mean, as with a lot of things, uh, yeah. modern trends change or modern brewing practices change what our expectations are. And Diamond is great. It's a classical German lager strain. As you say, ferments very, very cleanly, works really well for traditional style lagers. Yeah. However, now we're starting to push uh, the boundaries of what is a modern lager. So we've got New Zealand Pilsners, you've yeah. got, you know, all the way up to cold IPAs. These are all still using lager yeast. Yeah. Uh, and those traditional um, yeast strains probably produce a little bit too much of a unique flavor profile. With something like Nova Lager, you can still produce very clean, uh, traditional tasting lagers if you're fermenting cold. However, if you start to push the temperature range, it has quite a, Nova Lager has a very wide temperature range up to 20 degrees. You get a very um, clean but uh, fruit, fruity uh, profile, which works well with those sort of dry hop lager styles. Yeah, I see. So when it comes to dry hopping, and uh, you know, one of the questions that everyone always asks these days is, what's the biotransformation like for this type of yeast, and how would you, how would it compare to something like Diamond? Uh, so traditionally, lager yeast don't have a lot of biotransformation properties. You almost really look into culture yeast before you get uh, biotransformation from you know those German uh, yeast strains, but obviously culture is an ale strain. Um, Nova Lager is very different. Nova Lager has actually got um, a fair amount of beta-glucosidase activity, so yeah. it's releasing those um, uh, it's releasing those bound glycosides, releasing those uh, you know fruity aromas that are really going to get more from your dry hop. Yeah, great. So it can actually make uh, you know things like lugs and pilsners, but then add a little bit of dry hop and get a really good bang for our buck, I suppose, out of that. Absolutely. I've yeah. uh, personally I've brewed uh, pilsners with a tiny bit of um, yeah. like sars or cascade yeah. dry hop. Yep. And they taste fantastic. Reminds me of one of my favourite beers out of Germany. Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah. Now, reading the material, one of the uh, big things that you guys are talking about with this yeast is the fact that it has extremely low sulphur levels. Is that right? That's correct. So, uh, with for Nova Lager, as we did with Farnhouse, we partnered with Renaissance Bioscience. Um, and they have a patented uh, non-H2S strain, which yep. is part of the breeding program. And when that's bred with the classical... Um, Saccharomyces uh, abianus, then we get the lager character, but we actually remove the ability for it to produce H2S. It also produces very low diacetyl as well, which was a, yep. a pleasant surprise, but it's yeah. something that is very um, key for producing good, clean quality lagers. So it sounds like, um, you know, looking at this yeast, one of the major advantages, really, really clean results, but we're able to ferment faster and cleaner. So, you know, we're able to sort of really push over, push through those lagers very quickly, quicker than what we have been in the past. And because you don't need to, well, I might be jumping to too much, <laughs> but it, it, it would be fair to say you don't need the, a long diastole rest in this type of yeast. 
because of that low diastole produced in the first place. That's correct. And yeah. we would always recommend a diet to rest. It's always yep. a good thing to uh, to Just have to as safe. part of your practice. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but with this strain, uh, the failing utilization, which is usually how we categorize uh, when it's going to, well, no one's going to have a low diastole production. Yep. Um, we've seen that the uh, Nova Lager has uh, failing utilization very similar to an ale. So yep. you can almost treat it like an ale with regards to a diet to rest. You're yep. not having to give it four or five days warm plus a few yep. days cold to clean that up. Yeah, yeah, so uh, one thing that I sort of was uh, a little bit confused with is you look at some of the data which is out there and um, you know it seems like this on the paper is not as high flocculating as diamond but that's not actually 100% true, is that fair to say? Uh, it is. Um, we have we are categorizing it as a medium flocculating strain, um, yeah. but you know the results that are produced after you know you've matured it for a couple of weeks, or if you're adding finings or using any filtration, which yeah. is a very very clear beer. Um, but it, it does take a, just that little bit longer to, to yeah. flocculate out. Um, but you know that's not really of a concern if you're doing a nice uh, maturation period too. Yeah, exactly. So if you are looking at the spec sheet, it's probably worth noting that if you're comparing it with something like, I don't know, Diamond, uh, which has high flocculation, this, if you leave it for as long, will have you know equal levels of flocculation. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. If you're trying to turn it around very fast, yeah. you may have to use some findings yeah. or some filtration just to yeah, keep it a bit faster. Yep, yep. How exciting. Anyway, let's go out and have a look at a couple of fermenters. I'll show you it actually fermenting. We were a few days in, actually did an IPA and also did a Pilsner. So basically straight Pilsner malt and also put in some carapils, so really, really basic Pilsner recipe, which I've uh, chucked it in, and also got a IPA, which is actually one of our Fresh Cube Fresh Word kits, and I actually dry hopped it with a bit of Eclipse, doing a diastole rest, but I did two different beers. I've got one which is, um, you know, being fermented out, the bulk fermentation process around about sort of 12 degrees, and the other one for the IPA, I did at 18 degrees. Now, both seem to be fermenting really well. The uh, IPA, even after five days, came right down, so, um, let's go out and have a look at the fermenters and uh, I'll show you the yeast in action, I guess. Excellent. Let's do it. Okay. All right. Good one. Uh, okay. So I've actually got an IPA, as I was saying before. This is one of our fresh work kits, which we put into this uh, triconical. So we put down a double batch. So it's got about uh, 40 litres in there or so. And this one was fermenting out at uh, around about 18 degrees, but we've stepped it up for diesel rest at 20, 24. Uh, 24 for four days, that's rest was probably a bit too long, actually. Probably uh, that's the that first long. thing that Richard <laughs> said. It's like, oh, I'd probably don't that long. Maybe a day or two days tops. Would that be fair to say? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you yep. can use it just to get your dry hop in and yeah. get that. Uh, once it's you know, stable and it's finished, it should be yep. uh, in a couple of days, you'll be fine. Where is there a particular time you want to add dry hops with this particular type of uh, yeast? Is there, you know, would you add it sort of high krausen or, you know, do a hop step? Sometimes, you know, I know with the Vedant, I often step it down to like 14 degrees and then drop it in then but you know what's your kind of recommendation on that front i mean i think it's very open to uh experimentation yeah. however yeah. um you want to get some of that beta glucosidase activity you needs yep. a couple of days and some agitation to get that yep um so i would probably recommend you need you know three days before your end of ferment yeah. so maybe like half to one play-doh or yeah. you know, four or six uh sg yeah, then, yeah, yeah. it's a good time to add it in yeah. Uh, not losing too much of that hop aroma, but yeah. allowing for some of that bio transformation to come through as well. Yeah, I do shake my fermenter from time to time, especially <laughs> after I've dropped the, dropped the dry hop in. Is that a good idea, do you think? Uh, I mean, a lot of commercial brewers yeah. will rouse their dry hops yep. daily with some CO2, like yeah. just through uh, you know the bottom outlet, not necessarily rouse the yeast back up, but yep. at least try yep. and just agitate the uh, the hops in suspension. Yeah, uh, just sort of breaks up any clumps, gets yeah. the most out of those uh, those, those hops. hops. Yeah, definitely, nice one. Uh, so that's that one. Uh, we had a little bit of a taste before, and it's pretty much done. As I was saying before, it, it just really cranked through it. We got five days in, and it went down from 10.50 down to 10.10. And it's dropped down, down a little bit more down to 10, 1009. So, you know, right down there, obviously has dried it right out. Yep. I think it's, you know, that's an expected level of attenuation. We're seeing yep. around about 82, 84% attenuation, depending on, yep. you know, if you're dry hopping or not. And yep. obviously depending on your mash conditions as well. Yeah. But, you know, it sounds like you're pretty much spot on. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> As you can see there, Ollie, that's uh, 1009. I've never had actually this fresh work kit get that low, to be honest with you. So yeah, it was surprising when I came in this morning and saw that. Uh, now this is the Pilsner. Yeah, this one, I only just dropped this down uh, a few days ago. So the Pilsner now is sitting at 1038. So it started off at 
48, I think. Yeah, so we're only a few days in, but you can see there's a lot of activity in there. Um, you know, you were mentioning with the pitch rate, it's a little bit different to Diamond as well. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. So we're seeing with this, because of its uh, extra Saccharomyces genome in there, it's got more robustness and it has the fermentation kinetics that are um, very similar to an ale yeast. Uh, and as such, the pitch rate reflects that. So with Diamond, we recommend around about 100 grams per hectolitre or one gram per litre for, you know, a standard, what we say, a standard strength wort around yep. about, you know, 1044, 1048. Yep. Um, with the Nova Lager, we're actually recommending half a gram per liter or you know, five, 50 grams per hectolitre. Yeah, so okay. it's almost half yeah. the pitch rate that we would use with Diamond. And that's yep. reflected across the temperature range as well. So if you're fermenting yeah, okay. at a higher temperature, then you need a lower pitch rate. If yep. you're fermenting at the colder temperature, then you need a slightly increased pitch rate. Yep. Uh, but it's still uh, around about 50% of diamond and a lot of other dry log yeast as well yeah i see so it is a little bit more expensive than i think diamond but then you're getting better bang for your buck in in the fact that you can use less that's correct yep. that's correct yeah nice one all right well let's uh wrap it up there and then in a few days i'll whip some of these out have a bit of a tasting and we'll do the tasting on the video and uh that's it so this firmzilla 55 liter triconical has been in the fermentation chamber for five days now and as you can see the gravity has got right down there. So I'm sitting at 1.014. So it's come down really fast and that's why I brought it forward. I actually made a fermentation uh, profile, uploaded it to the uh, wrap portal um, called the Nova Low Temperature Profile, sitting at 12 degrees. And actually the profile had another three more days before the temperature stepped up to 14 and gradually built it up to 18 degrees. But I've basically fast forwarded a few days because I'm almost at uh, terminal gravity already. And now, yeah, we're just going to drop these dry hops in and see how we go. So it's about 10 days since we first started doing these experiments. Now with the IPA, the fresh work kit, I threw that down straight away. So that was basically all done and dusted in uh, around about six days, which is pretty quick because I fermented this one a little bit hotter. This one was fermented at 18 degrees and then stepped it up to 24 towards the end there. Um, I'm gonna put these uh, on the wrapped portal as well, the, the temperature profile. So if you wanted to repeat these exact tests that we've done, you can do that. Um, this one will be called Nova High Temperature Profile, and this one will be low, Nova Low Temperature Profile. Now, with the Pilsner, I actually brewed that one myself on the uh, Brazilla 65 liter. So this one took a few days later to get into the fermenter, so it was a little bit staggered, I guess. The uh, Pilsner here, it was fermented more or less in about maybe six and a half days or so. Um, now, in the six days, basically up until last night, actually it was still a little bit cloudy, so I did add a little bit of biofine to uh, just clear it up. And I think if you're really trying to, you know, get the most out of this yeast, a lot of people I assume will be using this yeast because they want to, you know, push through those lagers really quickly, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I suppose, you know, having a bit of findings in there is probably a good idea if you're really trying to speed up that lagering process, I guess. So, yeah, absolutely. I think if you were, uh, yeah, if you're looking for a quick turnaround with uh, with Nova Lager, yep. as soon as you get to the point where you're going to crash cool it, maybe you add your findings in then, you get a bit of the natural convection current. Yep. And then, you know, within a couple of days, you'll yeah. probably find that you've got good clear beer as, uh, yep. as well as a very clean profile. Yeah, definitely. So look, had if I left it another maybe one or two days, it probably would be even clearer. But because I added literally just last night, you know, there's still a little bit of cloudiness in this lager, probably more than what I would want in a Pilsner, let's say. But uh, anyway, let's have a bit of a taste and see what you think. Now I did add a little bit of Pacifica hop, not a lot. It was only about like just under a gram per liter in yep. this one. So probably a little bit of that citrus, citrus, citrus notes come through in this one that I kind of yeah, get. Yeah, anyway. a bit of citrus, a bit of herbal, you know, that mm. sort of little noble hop, which you'd expect from a Pilsner, yep. um, which you know, is very, very pleasant. Mm. There's a tiny bit of what I'd say is uh, like a struck burn match, a little bit of SO2. Yep. So something that we would expect with Nova Lager, although yep. we're not producing any H2S. 
Yep. Uh, because of the parentage, you also yeah. get some of the other sulfur compounds, so then you yeah. get a bit of SO2, yep. which all yeast produce, yep. as well as maybe some DMS from your lightly killed malts that you use in Pilsners. So yep. there's probably a little bit of sulfur compounds in there, but yep. certainly none of that. Undesirable um, sulfur. Yeah, yeah, undesirable H2S, yes. rotten yeah. egg. Uh, <laughs> sulfur sulfur. Yeah, I'm amazed at how clear this is, given how fast it's fermented out. It really sort of cranked through this one. You know, I've never done a lager actually this fast <laughs> even before. So, you know, that's given me a really, really clean result. Tastes, you know, really nice. It's actually a really nice uh, lager. Um, yeah, I, I'd probably just clear it up. Look, at, in some respects, I wouldn't mind doing this again and not even add any dry hop and see how clean it can get. Because I already feel like this is extremely clean yeah. Um, for something which has gone, it, you know, so, so quickly. Also, I mean, yes, or using it with like a Heller's yeah. style base, so a more malty, creamy yep. malt base, um, yeah. and then just letting the, the yeast yep. and the malt shine through, rather yeah. than, yeah. you know, the hop area. It would be very interesting to do a comparison with those. Yeah, and just on the topic of sulfur as well, because a lot of people sort of already started to call this a sulfur-free yeast, and as you mentioned, it means like no H2S, but with the SO2, the, the burnt match you were mentioning, that can sort of, to some degree, be controlled by your water chemistry as well. So it's going to depend on the, what, the sulfides that come in, in the, uh, the sulfates that come in, in into your water chemistry in the beginning. So if you've got a lot of calcium sulfate, then yep. I assume that then that would turn into more, you would you know, yeah, you would, at that burnt match. That's right, you'd expect there to be a little bit more uh, sulfur compound produced from yep. those sulfates. Yeah. Um, similar to, you know, using high, um, you know, high, how sulfate water such as yep. you know, burnt on train if you were using that water profile for yeah. your lager I would probably expect some sulfur yeah. more sulfur in there but yep. yeah, you're certainly not getting the H2S element to it uh, yeah okay so if you're going for that burnt on train recipe it could be actually you know good to intentionally sort of harden up that water add a lot of things like calcium sulfate I guess and yep. then that way you would be able to increase the amount of sulfur well, not the amount of SO2 uh, to, to achieve that sort of flavor profile you're going for with that style of beer as well, so. Absolutely, and particularly yeah. if you were doing a West Coast IPA with Nova yep. Lager, you could probably put a bit of yeah. sulfur and you get, get that crispness, get that um, you know, yeah. aggressive uh, hot bittering as well. well yeah. um, and then the fruitiness from the Nova Lager would you know, assist with yep. the, the dry hop profile as well. Yep, yep, definitely. All right, let's test this uh, IPA. So this is our Fresh Cube Fresh Work Kit. Basically, all I've done with this one was use the Fresh Work Kit um, chucked in the Nova Lager, but added a little bit of the Eclipse Hop as well. Well, when I said a little bit, I think it was about 100 and a little fraction over 100 grams. So, you yep. know, two grams per litre because it was a you know, double batch. Yep. It's got a you know, very pleasant malt character and, you know, the hops are they're, they're definitely to the fore. Um, yep. And you've got a little bit of that you know, citrus, a little bit of, yep. uh, I mean, Eclipse is probably more tropical yeah. fruit, but yeah. this has definitely brought out a bit more of that citrus um, mm. from, the, from the Eclipse, which we, you know, we'd expect to be a result of the biotransformation yep. side of it. Yeah. Um, again, very, very clean, really clean on the palate. Yeah, really clean. Um, yeah. Not too much ester. Yeah. There is definitely an yep. ester in there. There's yep. definitely yep. like yep. A, a soft sort of red apple, sweet red apple. Yeah. Um, but you know, probably not as much as you would expect mm. from. Uh, definitely not as much as something like Verdun. Um, yeah. Probably, uh, probably on par with uh, yep. BR197. Yeah. In terms yeah. of its ester profile. Yep. Still very very clean um, and allows the malt and yeah. allows the hops to shine through. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So it's kind of fantastic. It's amazing to see that a light yeast is so versatile. A with temperature, so it can be fermented at you know cold temperatures at like 12 degrees and then way up to, so this one was sort of between 18 and 24 for this profile and still give us really great results. So I suppose for those people who don't have a lot of temperature control, I imagine this is probably one of those yeasts which is gonna be really great, great, especially because a lot of customers, I think we've noticed that the, you know, things like the Quake yeast have taken off in sales really well, but I do find Quake sometimes has a bit of a kind of t I guess a bit of a twang to it, I guess, in the flavour. They do it's not super a, clean. Yeah, they so, do produce a bit of like a, an acidic flavour profile. They yeah. have like, and they, you know, uh, for Voss, yeah. Kvike has yeah. that um, uh, sort of uh, quite uh, sharp bitter orange yep. profile, yep. which is very desirable for some of yeah. the IPAs, you can use it for a hazy. Yeah. But <laughs> I definitely think with this, yeah. if you were, um, if you, you didn't have temperature control, yeah. if, if you were able to pitch the yeast at 10 degrees yeah. and just allow it to free rise to 20, yeah. by the time it got to maybe 15 or 16 degrees yeah. where you really start to see those esters come yep. through, you've yeah. probably done most of your fermentation. So you probably yeah. could actually produce a very yeah. clean, 
lager style yeah before we'd have the temperature control so. yeah <laughs> yeah totally so look i think it's going to be a great yeast for a lot of home brewers giving really clean results good level of biotransformation uh the flocculation's pretty good yeah so so far I've, I've seen sort of fairly good results if you give it enough time i'm sure that would be even better um, but um, yeah, probably the, the only beer I probably wouldn't really use this is probably a hazy because of that as well. So probably wouldn't really probably use it in that way, but still very versatile for, you know, ales, especially if you want them to flock out quite well and then and lagers uh, and those beers which you're adding, uh, you know, a reasonable amount of hop to because it's like uh, got that biotransform, biotransformative properties. Yep. Um, so yeah, and, and that's typically, as you mentioned earlier on in the video, you know, that's not typically, you know, something that a lager yeast would have as well. So, yep. you know, if you're using a traditional lager yeast and trying to add a lot of hops, you're probably not going to extract a lot of those hops, hop aromas. So you're going to have to sort of be either more heavy handed with the hop or you're simply just not going to get as much out of it. So that's right. yeah, really versatile yeast. And I think like it's right on trend as well. Cause like there's very, uh, there's very few of our customers are not adding hops, a lot of hop dry hops and stuff like that. <laughs> into the beers these days so yep. you know i'm really excited to see how this one goes is there anything else uh any other tips or anything else that we should mention oh actually one thing it's uh, probably worth mentioning is we played around with a little bit of pressure as yep. well and we did some low pressure and high pressure high pressure and we did notice that you know with the higher pressures it started to stall a little bit actually so have you guys done it like we only did we only did like one which was the lower pressure and one at a high pressure and once we got up to sort of 15 which is really too high like i should <laughs> i should say we have like adding pressure um it's one of those things that i think people have got a little bit carried away with pressure sometimes and added you know with all this pressure fermentation which i think is great and it's a great way to keep oxygen off beer and stuff like that but i think people get a bit carried away sometimes with fermentation and this was one where um, we found that like it could slow the fermentation down uh, quite a bit. Yeah. So is that something you've had in the experimentation? Uh, not yet. I mean, pressure yeah. ferment is you know yeah. very um, you know it's very new in terms of these yep. you know these uh, yeah. when we're doing a new yeast stream. Yep. Um, and you know certainly the effects of pressure yeah. fermentation are well known. Yeah. Um, and you know I guess just ensuring that yeah. you've got those you know good nutrition, you've got a good yeah. cell count right from the yeah. start. You're not you know inhibiting its growth, so you yeah. were able to um, yep. uh, <laughs> you get a get a good yeah. fermentation overall. Um, yeah. But yes, I mean, certainly 15 PSI is probably yeah, the top, much, end, yeah. top end of the range. We also um, did a few PSI, <laughs> like, you know, four, four, three or four PSI, and that actually worked quite well. So I think it's one of those things that, like, you know, using a bit of pressure is a good, good thing, but certainly too much of a good thing is a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. so it certainly can be that yeah. way. But, uh, yeah, it would be very interesting to continue those experiments through yeah. and sort of find out, uh, you know, if there is a, a happy medium where you're yep. getting uh, able to ferment at the higher temperature yep. but have a reduced ester profile uh, yeah. from the strain, you know, yep. by application of a bit of pressure. Just out of interest, though, like, if uh, does, does pressure affect biotransformation at all? Or not really? Because it's sort of like I can't answer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, yeah. As it's an enzyme, yeah. we wouldn't expect it to, but Probably not, whether yeah. it's, um, you know, it could, there could be some effects on the yeast in terms yeah. of the, you know, the excretion of the enzyme or its yeah. to cleave. Yep. Um, you know, pressure is a, is a stressful environment for, yeah. for yeast. So, yep. um, you know, it, it, theoretically could potentially affect the biotransformation, but it's yep. not something that we've studied or quantified. Yep, 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 fantastic. All right, no worries. So yeah, basically I think, uh, you know, this video shot obviously in 2022, but the yeast, I think in the 10 and a half gram sachets, when can we expect them to sort of, yeah. 11 grams, sorry, when, when can we expect them to, uh, to, to be available? We'd like to hope before Christmas, so you can yep. get some, uh, throw down some Christmas ales or yeah. Christmas lagers, um, yeah. or, you know, definitely in the, in the yeah. yeah okay fantastic so hopefully a lot of lager brewers out there you know getting stuck into it this summer and i think we should have some uh some 500 gram bricks a little bit earlier is that right so the uh, the 500 gram bricks are available yeah. um so yep. yes for so the yep. commercial brewers are able to, yeah. to produce so yep. but yeah well, hopefully the 11 gram bricks will be uh, available in the new year yep Fantastic. All right. No worries. We've got any other questions. Put them in the comments below and, you know, I'll basically uh, prompt uh, Richard if there's any, any curly ones that we can't answer ourselves. <laughs> and of course, if you want to uh, hear more about all the cool new stuff that's coming out, subscribe to this video. So bottom right hand corner, hit subscribe now. And of course, we've got our Facebook homebrew community group. You can join that one as well. Anyway, thanks so much for that, Richard. Like awesome to uh, try out this news. Super excited to see how it goes. I think it's really applicable to a lot of homebrewers. This particular strain that's going to make 
you know, doing lagers really easy, which typically in the past is quite a tricky uh, type of uh, beer to make for a lot of customers because, uh, you know, they have to, you know, traditionally have to monitor and control temperature really accurately and stuff like that. And yeah. I think this will just make it so much easier. So, yeah, so thanks so much for that. And uh, yeah, now I'll uh, see you guys next time, I guess. Catch you soon. No worries. All right, bye. Good one. Yeah, thanks for that.